This is Mr. Sharan at Primavera Online, and this will be a short tutorial on writing an effective hypothesis for your different science labs and projects that you'll need to complete in our, during our courses. So, writing for science. The goal of scientific method is to establish clear facts about the observable and testable world around us. Scientific writing, specifically writing for lab reports, must be extremely exact. To achieve this, scientists often use mathematical terminology to express concrete nature of their ideas and findings. This is true of hypothesis writing. So, what we want to say here is that as a writer of scientific papers, such as a lab report or a, a more formal scientific paper, when you state your hypothesis, it has to be very exact and clear. Um, common mistake that many students write is they write very general hypotheses where they don't properly identify a lot of parts and don't really tell you what's going to happen. So there isn't really a prediction to test. So let's go over what we should have and what are some of the signs of a good scientific hypothesis. So in general, the hypothesis, as you've probably already read, is very simply terms an educated guess. More importantly, a hypothesis should be a specific prediction that can be tested, and the test has to be have the potential of proving the hypothesis false. Now, this is often referred to uh, as a good hypothesis being both testable and falsifiable. Testable being that, meaning that you could physically create a test for this. Falsifiable meaning that the prediction you've made could potentially be wrong and could be proven wrong by the experiment itself. It's not to say it will be proven wrong, but it could be with the experiment. A hypothesis that doesn't meet one of these two criteria is not considered a valid hypothesis for scientific research. Now as to the format of a hypothesis, this is pretty standard. Um, all hypotheses generally follow the if-then-because format. If the if part, so this part of the statement is where you identify the independent variable of your experiment and how you're manipulating it. So you need to tell us what the independent variable is and how you manipulate it. The then part is where you identify the dependent variable in your experiment and how it, you predict it will react to the changes you made in the independent variable. The because part, now this part isn't always required, but you should always keep in mind that you should be writing these. Um, you should, if not required, you should always at least think this out and be able to answer this later as part of your conclusions. This part of the statement is where you identify why you think the dependent variable will change the way you predicted based on the changes you made to the independent variable. Now, this is a probably a key thing that I think a lot of students miss is that um, and this sometimes comes with the design of projects. They'll often ask you to write the hypothesis, but they haven't actually asked you to properly identify your variables in your experiment. So you sometimes will write that without the proper variables listed. So let me give you some examples of what I mean. So I'm going to take the setup for the version of the Galileo's inclined plane experiment. This is pretty much the speed lab experiment that many of people have been constructing in the integrated physics, chemistry and physics B course. Now, to give you a little background, this is a basic experiment where Galileo Galilei, trying to measure the rate at which objects fall towards the Earth, hit upon the idea that if he rolls them down a ramp, this would slow their rate of descent, giving him better chance of recording the actual time it takes. Uh, something that was very hard for him to do when he was just dropping the ball uh, objects straight to him towards the Earth. So, we have a couple of outcomes here that we're going to predict for, and there, I'm going to show you what these are. So, take a look at the very first hypothesis. If spheres of increasing size are rolled down the ramp, then the spheres of the smaller size will roll down the ramp in less time than the larger spheres because the smaller size spheres experience less friction. So here I've identified size of the spheres as my independent variable. I'm told you that 
and each part of the experiment, I'm going to increase the size of the sphere. So I'm going to use larger and larger spheres. And that when I compare the results, I predict that the smaller spheres will take less time to reach the bottom of the ramp than the larger ones. So I have made a testable prediction. This is something that if I, ru if I run enough trials, I should be able to confirm mathematically. And I've given a reason. I believe that the spheres have less friction. The smaller spheres experience less friction, so they'll roll faster down the, the ramp. Let's take a look at this again. So that's just one potential prediction. Let's think of another one. If spheres of increasing size are rolled down the ramp, then the spheres of the larger size will roll down the ramp in less time, so it means they'll go faster than the smaller spheres because the large spheres experience a gr stronger pull of gravity. Now, I want you to notice in both of these cases, I have not said faster or slower. I've said less or or more time. I've given the ed idea of how much time the, it would take. Now, the reason for this is that time is our dependent variable. That's what you're recording. That's what you're measuring. So we've, we're not calculating the velocity in this ex specific experiment. I'm just recording the time it takes to roll. We could then eventually derive velocity later, but that's a, for a different discussion. Finally, there's one last prediction I could make. If spheres of increasing size are rolled down the ramp, then the spheres will roll down the ramp in the same amount of time, regardless of size, because objects fall to the Earth due to gravity at equal rates. Now, this one, last one, is considered the null hypothesis, or the what-if-nothing-changes hypothesis. So, if I make changes in the parent variable and nothing happens, that's generally the null hypothesis. Usually what the null hypothesis tells us is that the two variables in question are not related and do not link to it, do not affect each other. Now, you don't always have to write the null hypothesis, but you need to be aware of it when you do your, cons your conclusions, because this would be one of the ways that you confirm whether your hypothesis was right or not. Once again, though, we've identified our two variables, and those should be clear in reading. You don't necessarily need to say they're the independent or dependent variable, but it should be clear to anyone watching or anyone reading that they can pick that up. So, that's some basics on how to write a good hypothesis with a few examples to think about. Um, keep this in mind with any of your projects or science experiments that you have to do that require you to do hypothesis writing for this format. And keep in mind, take a look at what this. I have not limited this. I've not tried to write it short. I've put in as much detail as possible so as there's no confusion that I can misinterpret later as part of my conclusions. Alright, so good luck writing your hypotheses from now.